Jesus is our propitiation. Pepsi Station? No, not Pepsi Station. Look, look above. Propitiation. Hey, Mr. Funnigan. Yeah. You like Pepsi or Coca Cola? All aboard! Break every 
Lord, we thank you for bringing us here together today. We thank you, God, for our fellowship that's all in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your spirit that has drawn us together and constantly draws us to the heart of Jesus Christ. 
We thank you, Lord, that now in this moment, as we are in a, a state of worship and an attitude of worship, we're now ready to hear from your word today. And I pray that as we do, we will do it worshipfully, meaning that we will surrender to what you say today and that we will acknowledge where sin has entered into our lives and that it needs to be dealt with. It needs to be forgiven. We must come to repentance and we must be renewed in our spirit and in our mind. So help us, Lord, to hear you today in a submissive way and to be ready to be changed by your spirit because everything that you want to do in us and for us is good and it glorifies you. And that's why we are here today, Lord, to give you glory, to give you praise, that our lives will honor you. And so with that attitude of worship, open our ears now and our hearts to receive your word and to be transformed by it today. Thank you, God. You're so good and so gracious, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. Thank you, Sister Yanti and musicians. Welcome, everybody, to church today. It's good to see everyone. I notice that uh, every time we come together for Sunday service, it's, it seems like everybody is as far away from me as you can possibly get. Uh, but hopefully this won't last forever, uh, and we'll be able to get a little bit closer uh, to one another. But that's okay. You can all hear me, and we are all in the presence of God today. Amen? Amen. So if you have your Bibles with you, will you open them to the book of Philippians? We are entering now into chapter 2, and today we're going to concentrate on verses 1 to 4. Today's sermon is titled, Why Do We Do, or Why We Do, What We Do? Why We Do what we do. And we're going to look at that in two parts here today. So if you'll find that chapter in Philippians, chapter 2, and stand with me as I read these four verses. Let's stand in honor of the Lord as we read His Word today, and I pray that we're all blessed by the Holy Spirit through it today. Verse 1, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ... If any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Why we do what we do. In today's text, Paul summarizes some of the main points he focused on in chapter 1 of Philippians regarding the Christian life and also the fellowship of believers within the church. And then in our text today, he introduces another very precious quality of the believer who has been touched by God, who has been changed by the Holy Spirit, and who now walks before the Lord. Today we will consider this brief summary that Paul gives to us, which shows us what we do as Christians or how we are to behave as Christians, and we'll also consider why we do what we do. I mean, if somebody were to come to you and ask you, why, as a Christian, why do you do the things you do? As a Christian, why do you behave in the manner manner which you behave? What would you tell them? I hope you wouldn't say, well, I do what I do because that's what Pastor Heath tells me to do. I hope that's not your answer. Or would you say, I do what I do because 
The church has given me a checklist, a take-home checklist to put on my refrigerator, and every day I make a check off of the things I'm supposed to do in being a Christian. That's not your answer, because we don't hand out checklists for you to take home. So the question is then, why do we do what we do as a Christian? For you husbands that are here today, faithful, strong husbands, if I were to ask you, why do you love your wife the way you do? And why do you do the things you do for your wife? I hope you won't respond by saying, I do what I do because my mom tells me I should be good to my wife. I hope you don't say also that I do what I do for my wife because she put a checklist on the refrigerator at home of what I'm supposed to be doing. Husbands, if your wife has to do that, shame on you, husbands. There must be something else. There must be something greater than that. There's something much deeper than that, isn't there? So why is it that we do what we do as Christians or as husbands, as wives? Why? Well, I hope today's message opens our eyes to see the answer to that question. And I hope that if you find that you're not doing so well in the areas of Christian life, whether it's your obedience to the Lord or your your attitude, your character, your relationships. If you find that you're not doing so well in some areas, then I hope today you will know what may need to be worked on in your own spiritual life. And so I hope this message helps you to look at things a bit differently today. Now I'm going to present today's message backwards. We're going to discuss what we do before we discuss why we do it. And so because we're doing it that way, it means we're going to focus on the second half of our verses first, and then we'll look at the first half of our verses. Why do we do what we do? First, we're going to look at what Paul tells us we should be doing, and then we're going to see why we do such things. You with me? You ready? Why do we do what we do? So let's look, number one, what it is we are supposed to be doing. How it is that we are supposed to be behaving as Christians. What we do. Let's look at that verse, number two, Philippians 2, verse 2. Paul says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. First, what do we do? Paul says we are to be like-minded. He says, fulfill my joy. Now I can assure you, Paul is already filled with joy as he's writing this letter to the church in Philippi. He's already filled with joy. He's already expressed it in so many ways. Even as a prisoner in Rome, he is filled with great joy. And the joy he had, no one, and nothing could take it away from him. But now, he's asking for an overflow of joy. He's asking for joy on top of joy. It's the joy that overflows from his heart knowing that the church in Philippi is united in fellowship and in love. And so what he says in this verse, he's already talked about this. In chapter 1. He's already gone over it, and so have we. But just as a quick summary of these things, he says, first of all, we are to be like-minded. Do you remember what that meant? As a church, if we are like-minded, it means that in our minds we are focusing on the same goal. Who we are and what we do, our purpose in this world, it's all focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. And everything we do is for Him. Everything we do is to shine a spotlight on the Savior of the world. And if we are to continue moving together as a church, we have to stay focused on that one thing. 
that all we do is to honor Jesus Christ. And you know that's true for our church. It's also true for your family, isn't it? I mean, as a husband and wife, you've got to be focused together on the same goals in life. Otherwise, you're going to have a, have a lot of hardships. Yes, on top of all things, a husband and wife need to agree. The most important thing is that we honor our Lord and Savior, Jesus, in the way we love each other, in the way that we're going to raise our children, in our important life decisions that we make. It must honor Jesus. And it goes even beyond that. You know, I, I just, um, on my YouTube um, channel or, or my YouTube profile, I was recommended to watch a video uh, from a, a man named Dave Ramsey, who is a, a Christian financial coach, I guess you could call him. And a, a lady called into his radio station and explained to Dave Ramsey that even though she's trying to do everything she can to save money, to spend money responsibly and, and to prepare for retirement, her husband just spends and spends and spends. And so she came to Dave Ramsey and said, what should I do? And he explained to her the importance. If you and your husband are going to be successful in saving and planning for your financial future and planning to provide for your children someday, you need to come to an agreement on how important this issue is. You need to both agree that it makes sense to do this. That it honors the Lord to be prepared financially and to use your money as a good steward of what God has given to you. If you don't talk about these things, you're both going to be moving in different directions in life. And you're going to be calling me every week asking me what you should do about your husband. And when I heard that, I thought, how much sense does that make? Not only in our faith, but in everything we do as husband and wife, as family. We have to know where we're going in life. What are our goals in life? And how do we get there? We've got to talk about those things and come into an agreement. It's the same with here in the church. We must be like-minded. Otherwise, we move in two different directions, and it doesn't work that way. He also says to love. Love. In chapter 1, Paul prayed that they would abound in love. More and more. Philippi was already a church of love, but Paul wanted them to grow in that love. Exponentially grow. And do you know what I've learned this year? That as Christians, our love grows, or we have the opportunity to have our love grow in times of adversity and trial. Because this year, more than I can remember, I think, in the past, because of this pandemic we are going through still today, I can't tell you how many Christians I've heard criticizing other Christians. Because some Christians say, don't wear a mask. Other Christians say, no, you need to wear a mask. Some Christians say, you don't need to go to church, just stay home. Other Christians say, no, if you don't go to church, you have no faith. You don't trust in God. And all of this fighting going on, this pandemic, I'm sure we all have our own hot button when it comes to this whole entire thing that we're going through. And I've even heard people use the Bible or use Jesus to argue their point. Why should you wear a mask? Because that's what Jesus would do. Why shouldn't I wear a mask? Because Jesus wouldn't do it. Shame on us if we're using Jesus to make an argument, to argue our way through something. Shame on us if we criticize other Christians in the name of Jesus. What would Jesus say about this pandemic and how we respond to each other? Would he not say, Love your neighbor. And whatever you do, whatever you decide, whatever you say, whatever your attitude, be sure to love your neighbor. What does that look like? Well, I'm sure he'll teach you. 
through the rest of this pandemic, and then we come out on the other side of it. But this is our opportunity right now. We've got to show love to each other. Even those who are criticizing us for meeting in a sanctuary. Even for those who criticize us if we want to wear a mask or if we don't wear a mask. We have to be ready to love. So thank God for the opportunity to grow this year and abound more and more in love. And then third in this verse, we are taught that we need to be undivided. We are to be of one accord, one mind, undivided. In chapter 1, Paul said to the church in Philippi, you need to have discernment. Grow in love and grow in discernment. In other words, if love is important to this church body, then we need to know what increases love and we need to know what damages our love for one another. That's discernment. Knowing which is good and which is bad for our church. And so to be undivided, we need to make sure we're always concentrating on the one goal, Jesus Christ. That we always love one another and we refuse to allow division to creep into our church. Do you know that Satan, in order to attack a church, persecution and trials from the outside, I think you'll see through history, only strengthens the body of Christ. But do you know what can destroy the body of Christ? Division from inside. From one brother being mad at another sister, and then they fight. And then before you know it, they've got their own teams of people fighting against each other. That's when you have what is called today a church split. Because now a congregation doesn't get along with each other, and their only answer is to split away from the main church and start another church. I'm not sure if God blesses that kind of a movement. May we be undivided. Amen? You with me? Okay, talk louder with those masks on. Then Paul begins introducing not a brand new concept, because you can find this concept in the ingredients of being like-minded, having the same love, being undivided. You can find this concept in those things, but now Paul is about to say with explicit language a new concept that we need to learn. It's the concept of humility. Humility. Ah. Humility. The one thing that every Christian struggles with, being humble. Depending on the circumstance or depending on the person you've got to deal with or the group of people that you've got to deal with, humility is often a great challenge we all face. If only we could live without people, then we can learn to be humble. But unfortunately, we can't get rid of people. And so we better learn to be humble. And humility is that kind of thing that when a Christian says, ah, I've got it, I have humility, that's the moment they actually lose humility. So what is humility? And why is it important? Well, let's look at Paul's language as he describes what humility is. Verse 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. In other words, let all we do be done without, first of all, selfish ambition. Do you know what selfish ambition is? It's when someone says, I want to do what I want to do. I will do whatever is best for me. It's not about you, it's about me, me, and me. Now we expect that kind of attitude out of kids, right? When kids are kids, they think the world revolves around them. And that life is all about them and their needs and what they want and where they want to go. 
How many times have we had McDonald's? Not because it's what we want, but it's because it's what the kids demand. I go to McDonald's close to every Sunday because I have some girls in the car that are crying out for it. But when children grow up, when we grow up, we start to discover, you know what? Life isn't all about me. And the decisions I make don't only affect me. When you get married, husbands or wives, your life and your decisions affect your partner. And when you have children, you no longer think just for yourself. You have to think about your children and all your decisions as well. Because everything you do, your life, it affects them. As a father, if I live a sinful life, my sin doesn't just affect me. It will affect my wife and it will affect my children in a negative way. We are not to have selfish ambition because this life is not just about you. It's about the people who are around you as well. Let all things be done also without conceit. Do you know what that is? Conceit is when someone says, I want the credit. I want the glory. I want to be recognized for what I have done. How good is that for the body of Christ? How good is that for anything? I don't know about you, but I'm a sports fan. And I'm sure you have your own sports that you probably watch, team sports. I'm from America, so my favorite sport is American football. And I've seen what happens to teams that have a sudden superstar on their team. A quarterback, a wide receiver, a defensive end, and they're the best at what they do. And I've seen what happens when that person knows they're the best, and all of a sudden every game becomes, becomes about them and about their statistics, and about their success. They care more about their fame, their money. They care more about being recognized. And as soon as that happens, there's division among the team. And if that team doesn't kick out that one cancer of a player, that team will never be good. And even if they are, nobody will respect them. I love football teams. I do have one favorite football team, but I love it when I see a team playing for a win, however it comes. I love watching a team where everyone knows we've all got to step up together. We've all got to do our part. It's not about this person or me. We all have a job to do. And I love when I see coaches coaching a team like that. Most important, we've got to get the win However we get it, and we've got to keep growing as a team. And even if that's not my team, I at least respect that team. I respect that coach that teaches such things. Because as soon as you have people who are conceited, you destroy the team. Conceited people also will destroy the body of Christ. And also he mentions that we must be, as an attitude, we have to have lowliness of mind, esteeming others better than ourselves, and being genuinely concerned for others' well-being. But in today's society, we put up so many barriers to this. Because how often do people say, but I'm right, and they're wrong. But they work for me. I don't work for them. But I'm older. And they need to be respectful of me because I'm the older person in this situation. Now, I've said this before in other sermons, but I believe it's always going to be true, no matter what. And it certainly applies to today's message. And here it is. We can never go wrong by obeying the Lord Jesus. You will never go wrong with living your life according to what God's word says. And, take it a step further, we will never be the loser for following the Lord. No matter what situation you're in, 
If you live according to God's word, you will never come out as the loser in that situation. Now maybe other people will say that about you, but in heaven's eyes, in the eyes of your Lord, which matters most, you will never lose following him. You'll never come out as the loser and you can never go wrong by obeying him. Now when I look at scripture, I can never find a circumstance where a man or woman of God humbled themselves and then destroyed their lives as a result. I've never seen it. I never found it. Every time I find a man or woman of God humbling themselves, it always brought blessing to them and to their family. For example, Abraham and Lot. Do you remember that relationship? Abraham is the uncle. Lot is the nephew. Abraham was the one called by God, and Lot followed. Abraham, Abraham was the one to receive the promise of blessing from God, and he brought along Lot. And as time went by, the two camps of people were fighting with each other. And Abraham knew this can't happen because we're family. So we need to make distance between ourselves for the sake of keeping peace. So Abraham went to Lot, Abraham the uncle, the older one, the one called by God, the one with all the promises, he went to Lot and he said, Lot, look all around. Here is the land. You choose first. Where do you want to settle your family? And we might say, well, hold on, Abraham. You're the uncle. You do what you want to do. Let your nephew take second, you know, the leftovers. Abraham, you're the one called by God. You don't need to hum humiliate yourself below your, your nephew. Abraham, you make the first decision. Abraham didn't do it. He humbled himself below his nephew, and he said, Lot, you choose first. And in that whole circumstance, do you know what Abraham lost as a result? Nothing. Nothing. Do you know what he gained? He gained peace with his family. He gained the promises of God. He gained the great nation, Israel. And he gained us as spiritual brothers and sisters in Christ. Ruth and Naomi. All the men of the family died. Ruth, who's the daughter-in-law of Naomi. Naomi said, Ruth, I'm a Jew. You're a Moabitess, so you go home and go back to your family. I'll go back home and be with my family. But it's not right that you would stay with me. And Ruth refused to leave. Ruth was hanging on to Naomi. And she said, wherever you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Ruth humbled herself even when she didn't have to. She humbled herself before Naomi. And do you know what Ruth lost as a result? Nothing. Do you know what she gained? She gained the family of Israel. She gained a husband named Boaz. And she gained the honor of being in the genealogical, gene, genealogical line of Jesus Christ. Because her grandson was David the king. Speaking of David the king, a young boy who was anointed king over Israel... What did he do about King Saul, who was already king? Did David go and kick Saul out? Dethrone him? Kill him? No, he could have many times. But David refused to dishonor King Saul. So he humbled himself below Saul. Even though Saul hated him and wanted him dead, he humbled himself. And as a result, do you know what David lost? Come on. Nothing. Do you know what he gained? Not only the throne of Israel, but all the promises of God that his throne would be an everlasting throne. Why? Because Jesus Christ would come and sit on that throne forever and ever. And then here comes Jesus in the New Testament. He says, I am the son of David. What an honor to David. Abraham, Ruth, and David, 
They lost nothing as a result of humility. All they did was gain in God's eyes. As Christians, this is what we do. This is how we are to behave. To be like-minded, loving one another, and being undivided in all of it with a heart and a mind of humility. Now why do we do this? Why do we do what we do? I believe if we can learn the why, then the what will come more naturally in our life. Not that humility is in our nature to be, but as God creates us into a brand new creation, a new man or a new woman, this is to be a part of the Christian life, humility. So now, why do we do what we do? Let me first just go ahead and answer this. Why do we do what we do? According to what we're reading today, here's the answer. Because we are aware of and we are thankful for what we have received from the Lord. Make note of that if you want, and you can apply this to every area of your life. Why do we do what we do? Why do we humble ourselves? Why do we love? Why do we do these things? Because we are aware of and we are thankful for what we have received from the Lord. So if today you're having difficulty loving, difficulty with showing humility, then something is wrong with this statement in your life. Maybe you're not aware of what the Lord has done for you. Maybe you're not aware of what the Bible says about you when you trust in Jesus Christ. Maybe it's that. Or maybe you're aware of it, but you find no appreciation for what the Lord has done. I mean, you read it, you see it, you hear about it, and there's not an ounce of gratitude in your heart. That's a problem. But when you are both aware of it, what he's done, and you're thankful for it, what you have received from him, then it makes love and humility begin to flow more and more in your life. So, why do we do it? It's all in verse 1. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, in this verse, let me ask you, what have we received from the Lord? Well, this verse tells us four things. According to this verse, we have received consolation, comfort, communion, and compassion. Are you aware of that? Well, let's take a closer look then. Number one, the consolation in Christ. Consolation, this word means that someone has come alongside of you. Somebody has been called to come to your side in order to help you. Who's done such a thing? Well, according to the verse, it says consolation in Christ. It is Jesus who has come near us. Think of that. We, the sinners, we who were rebellious and enemies of God, when Jesus came into the world, God the Son put on human flesh, came and dwelt among us. He came near the sinner. That's the consolation in Christ. And on that day, and in that moment that he saved you, he came near you to your side, and he comforted you with his love. And not only did he come at that moment of salvation to stand near you, to console you, but every day of our life now, as we walk through life, there is that good shepherd who never leaves our side. You know, Jesus, in the book of John, he called the Holy Spirit the comforter, which meant 
the, the paraclete, or the one who comes alongside of you. And now Paul calls Jesus the same exact thing. The paraclete, the one who walks alongside of you. And this is what Jesus has done for us, and he continues to do it every day of our life. Jesus promises, I will never leave you. Even until the end of the age, I'm there at your side, and I never leave. Think of that for a moment, that the great God of this world, the creator of heaven and earth, the holy, glorious, righteous judge of the world, he's the one that came down to us and has come near us. And if you can think about that in the right attitude, you will say with the psalmist, when I consider your glorious wonders, who am I and what is man that you are so mindful of me? Who am I that you have come to visit me? Has the Lord come near to you? Amen? Are you thankful for it? The comfort of love. Comfort. That word means to be persuaded. Comfort of love means to be persuaded of love. What love? Love here is translated agape, which is God's sacrificial love for you. Everlasting love for you. This means that we are persuaded that that is God's love for me. Do you know, I've met so many people, even just recently, who can look at the verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. If we believe in him, we will not die but have everlasting life. People, I've watched them look at that verse and read it and then say, so, that's a person who's not persuaded by the love of God. But how many of us have read that verse and we have said, oh, thank you, God, for such a great love. Thank you, God, for the gift of Christ in my life. Thank you, Lord, that now that I have received Christ, I will not die but have everlasting life. I am persuaded that God loves me with an everlasting, great, abundant love. And we can say with Paul from the book of Romans, I am persuaded that nothing can ever separate me from that love of God. Hallelujah. Oh, how he loves me. He died for me because he loves me, even though I was a rebellious sinner. And that love he has for me, he loved me before I even knew who he was. What a great love. Have you been persuaded of God's love for you? Are you thankful for it? Then there's communion. Paul calls it the fellowship of the Spirit. When we were saved, when we put our trust in Jesus, we were brought into a family. First of all, we were united with Christ. And we can call God Father. We were united with Christ by the Holy Spirit. We became children of God. We can cry out to him, Abba, Father. We have fellowship with God. And then we also have fellowship with each other. We are the children of the one true God. That's why when Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way, our Father in heaven, our Father, we have been brought into this wonderful fellowship with each other. Have you realized that? Are you thankful for the people God has brought into your life? Are you thankful for that relationship that you can have with God? Some of us were just talking this past week. There are many of our families, including my own, that came to Indonesia right around the year 2011. Daniel and Paige, uh, brother Rajan, who's here, uh, Julio and Julieta. Many of us came right around that same time, and we just... We just talked about how thankful we are that God brought us to Indonesia and brought us together. I can't imagine life without knowing all of you. All of you. And I'm thankful for every single one of you and that God has brought us into this fellowship. 
Do you know that fellowship of the Holy Spirit? And are you thankful to have that with God and with each other? And last, compassion. Or as Paul calls it, affection and mercy. Affection here is also used as the word compassion when it talked about how Jesus bore the needs and the burdens of other people. And he felt their pain inside of himself. That was compassion. And that is what we have received from Jesus. He is our burden bearer. And he knows all the things that we go through. And not only does he have compassion, but he also has mercy for us. Mercy simply means you didn't get what you deserved. Now before you think that's unfair, think about what you deserved. Judgment and hell. That's what we deserved. Did we get it? No. Why? Because Jesus came and died for us. And through him we have the mercy of God. So now what is Paul saying here? Paul's saying, if you, brothers and sisters, if you know and have experienced that consolation in Christ, if you have experienced that comfort of love, that communion that you have with God, and that mercy that's been shown to you even when you didn't deserve it, who among us has a right to say, I will not love that person? I will not show humility toward that group of people or that person. I will not show love or humility. I will not show compassion or mercy. Who do we think we are to ever say such a thing? If you ever feel that way, you need to remember what God did for you. And you need to remember that you did nothing to deserve it. Now, does that person in your life deserve your mercy? Maybe not. Does that person deserve love? Maybe not. But we're called to do it anyway. To be merciful, to be compassionate, forgiving, kind, and to love, even when it's not returned to us. So, musicians, would you come? Do you find yourself struggling with loving someone today? Do you find yourself struggling with showing humility? Maybe in your family, maybe in your workplace. Whatever relationship you may be thinking about today. If you're struggling with showing these things, then think about this. Think about what Paul has just said. And be reminded of all the goodness of God, the love that he has shown you, even though you didn't deserve any of it. And let us be thankful for what we have received. Let us be aware of, thankful for, what we have received from the Lord Jesus. And if you can do that, if you can remember that, humility comes a little bit easier in your life. Amen. Let's all stand together. I asked Sister Yanti to lead us in the song that we ended our worship service with, but can we sing the verses that belong to that song? And as we do, to me, these verses really capture what we just talked about today. And as we sing them together, think about them. Be thankful that we can say such things. And let's let the Holy Spirit move among us today. Amen. was my cross you bore, so I could live in the freedom you died for. And now my life is yours, and I will sing of your goodness forever. my cross you bore so I could live in your freedom you died for and now my life is yours and I will 
sometimes it's so important for us to come back to your word and to find the foundation of truth you have laid for us and when we look at that truth it reminds us of who you are and what you have done and who we are now in Jesus Christ and if we're honest with ourselves and we cast away pride. The only thing that's left to say from our lips is thank you. Thank you for what you have done for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming into this world, to coming to a sinner like me, and to draw near to my life, and to open my eyes and my heart to receive the gift of eternal life, the gift of salvation. Jesus, before I even knew your name, you knew mine, and you loved me even then. And you love me today, and you will love me tomorrow. Yes, even though I often fail, and though I often make mistakes, and though there are times I don't show love or humility, there you are still beside me to comfort me with such great love. Thank you for constantly healing me and for forgiving me and for leading me on through this life. I will never forget what you have done for me, God. And I pray, Lord, that we will be persuaded that the love that you have for us, there's nothing like it in this world. We won't find it anywhere else. It's a love, God, that sent your son to die for me. Even when I was still stuck in my sin, helpless in my condition, I was your enemy and I was rebellious against you. 
in love. Jesus, you came and still you died for me. Oh, what comfort that gives to me. That's an undying love. That is an eternal love. That is a love that won't let me go. And because of it, Lord Jesus, I will neither let go of you. God, help us to think of these things. Help us to remember these things. And I pray that in our relationships with people, whether it's our husband or our wife, our parents or our children, our fellow uh, workers in our workplace, our boss, those who work for us, brothers and sisters in Christ, in every relationship in life, let humility and love come from a heart that has recognized what you have done for us and a heart that is overflowing with thanksgiving for what you have done. And I pray, Lord, that we will be merciful as you have been merciful to us. We will love as you have loved us. We will forgive as you have forgiven us. And we will be compassionate in the way that you have shown compassion to us. In every marriage that is here today, let there be love, peace, and forgiveness. Yes, Lord. There's a marriage today in this sanctuary right now that needs forgiveness and love. Lord, do the work. Do the work in that marriage right now, God. Bring husband and wife back together once again in forgiveness and in love. And help them to love in a way that doesn't bring up the past. It doesn't bring up the past mistakes. It doesn't glory in itself and or we're not seeking our own glory or our own gratification we love sacrificially because that's the love that we have received thank you God thank you God for your word today I pray Lord that throughout this week as we continue to read over it meditate on it Holy Spirit keep doing that transforming work in us that we will truly be Christ like in our life Thank you, God. And now as we are getting ready to leave this sanctuary and go our separate ways, God, I pray that you will be a, a constant reminder to us about your love and your grace and your peace for us. God, keep us in your hands. And I pray that you will bless us one and all. In all that we do in every area of our life, may we be blessed by you, not blessed in the eyes of this world, but blessed according to heaven's riches. Bless us, God, and keep us. Be gracious to us every day. Give us peace in our hearts and in our minds. Shine your face upon us, O oh God. Yes. And let the world see the reflection of your glory on us. And I pray that all who know us, they will know that there is one Lord in our life. There is one King. There is one God and one Savior. His name is Jesus. And I pray that you will use us to draw all men to Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your fellowship with us and among us. Bless us now as we leave to our separate places. And now we pray all these things in the name above every name. And that name is Jesus. And we all say together, amen. 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 God bless you and be with you. Amen.